Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune chronic inflammatory disease characterized by dense infiltration of lymphocytes in the exocrine glands. Essentially the body's own immune cells, the lymphocytes, attack and infiltrate various exocrine glands and cause their functional impairment. The salivary and the lacrimal glands are classically affected in Jogren syndrome, resulting in xerostomia or dry mouth and keratoconjunctivitis sicca or dry eyes respectively. Exocrine glands in the gastrointestinal system, respiratory system, skin and vagina may also be affected. Now there are two types of presentations of Jogren syndrome. One where patients manifest with functional impairment of exocrine glands, especially with xerostomia and keratoconjunctivitis sicca. And the other where patients apart from dry mouth and dry eyes also have other associated autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus or scleroderma. The former is called primary Jogren syndrome or Sika syndrome and the latter is referred to as the secondary Jogren syndrome. Now Jogren syndrome is not an uncommon condition and affects middle-aged to elderly adults usually in the age group of 40 to 50 years. The condition is predominantly seen in females with a female to male ratio of 9 is to 1. Males and children could also be very rarely affected. At least 50% of patients may manifest with bilateral parotid gland enlargement. Now the main manifestations of Jogren syndrome are xerophthalmia and xerostomia. The eyes are dry, itchy and painful. And apart from dry eyes, patients also have a scratchy sensation, like there is sand or gravel in the eyes. The chronic dryness and inflammation could cause keratosis of the ocular surface. And this condition is hence called keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Ocular symptoms are least severe in the morning, with the symptoms worsening throughout the day. Xerostomia or dry mouth could lead to a variety of secondary manifestations in the oral cavity. In general, the oral mucosa is inflamed, erythematous, and may be accompanied by burning sensation. Patients may have an altered taste sensation, difficulty in eating and swallowing. The tongue appears to be fissured and also inflamed and erythematous due to atrophy of the papillae. Now saliva essentially has antibacterial properties, maintains the pH of the oral cavity and has a self-cleansing action. Hence a lack of saliva would mean that these patients could be highly susceptible to dental caries and periodontal disease. Patients may also manifest with erythematous candidiasis and angular chelitis secondary to xerostomia. Now, salivary glands of patients affected with this disorder show a pattern under the microscope called lymphoepithelial psilidinitis. The affected tissue shows a dense infiltration by lymphocytes, and this infiltration could result in destruction of acinar units of the gland. Few residual ductal epithelial cells may, however, persist and rather proliferate in this chronically inflamed environment. They form round to irregular islands with lymphocytic infiltrates and may have residual ductal lumens. These islands are called lymphopithelial lesions and we've previously called epimyopithelial islands. Minor salivary glands from the lower lip of affected patients are usually biopsied and checked for aggregates of lymphocytic infiltration. Now a glandular area of 50 or more lymphocytes is considered to be a focus and the presence of more than one focus in an area of 4 mm square of glandular area is considered to be supportive of a diagnosis of Jogren syndrome. The most recent criteria for diagnosis have been proposed by the American European Consensus Group in 2016. And according to their criteria, a diagnosis of Jogren syndrome can be made if an individual has an unstimulated salivary flow rate of less than 0.1 ml per minute. Now this is an objective evidence of dry mouth. Fails the Schrimmer's test, and has abnormal findings with fluorescent staining. These two examinations test the lacrimal function and is objective evidence for keratoconjunctivitis. Is positive for anti-SSA antibodies. It shows lymphopithelial psilidinitis under the microscope and more than one focus of at least 50 lymphocytes in an area of 4 mm square of glandular parenchyma. 
So the individual is given points according to the number of criteria he or she is positive for and a final score of 4 or more is considered to be Sjogren's syndrome positive. However, this is considered only after the patient has met certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. There is no effective treatment for Sjogren's syndrome. Treatment is usually symptomatic and systemic therapy should be considered according to the organ affected. And as far as the oral symptoms are concerned, artificial saliva could be administered or the use of sugarless gum or candy could help in moistening the oral cavity. The patient should be motivated to maintain oral hygiene due to the increased risk of dental caries and periodontal disease. Silogogs like pyrocarpin could be administered to help in salivary secretion and artificial tears could help better the condition of dry eyes. Of significance is the fact that Sjogren's syndrome patients have an increased risk of developing low-grade non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma.